And the next talk will be by Mat Matthias Salzga that will tell us something about uh, independent causal order and space-time. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so the talk is titled Connecting Independent Causal Order Processes to Composable Quantum Protocols in a Space-Time. Um, and this was based, this is based on my master's thesis that was completed together with uh, Vilassini. Um, and I want to begin by talking about this, these indefinite causal order processes. Uh, so usually in quantum mechanics, you think of some kind of fixed order. We have some circuit and uh, we have Alice acting before Bob, or we have this gate being applied, then this gate being applied, then the next gate being applied. Um, and the idea of this indefinite causal order is that we drop this assumption and we do not assume there's any kind of ordering between Alice or Bob. Um, and then we take all possible correlations that give us reasonable probability, so nothing like the probability is minus one or something like that. Um, and this is what is called a process matrix. So um, on the side you see a uh, picture of a process matrix where you have this process matrix W in pink and then you plug in these agents, Alice and Bob. Um, and so the interesting about these is that they violate so-called causal inequalities. And I don't want to talk too much about these because I don't have time, but you can essentially think of these as some kind of analog to bound inequalities. Um, so these are bounds set by fixed order processes, uh, just like for bound inequalities, you have bounds set by separable states. And then uh, some of these process matrices can violate these, uh, bound uh, these, these causal inequalities just like entangled states can uh, violate bell inequalities. And this is therefore interesting because violating bell inequalities is, in is interesting. So maybe we can get some kind of quantum advantage if we can actually realize these process matrices. Um, this leads us to the open questions we try to tackle in this project. So it's not really clear if these process matrices are all physical. Um, there's really no physical assumptions that we put in this framework. It's just like, let's drop this assumption of uh, causal ordering and let's take everything that doesn't look completely unreasonable. Um, but it could turn out that some of these are eliminated by some kind of physical consideration. So we wanted to answer, can we implement these process matrices? In particular, can we implement them in some kind of classical background space time? So without making some appeal to uh, some sort of quantum gravity. And then our second question we had is, um, what's about composition? So it turns out that um, composition doesn't really work this well in this framework. Uh, in particular, if you imagine you have two process matrices and you implement them in a lab, um, then you can, can compose them in a way in the lab that you cannot compose them in the framework of process matrices. And we were wondering, can we somehow recover this uh, behavior that we would expect in a lab um, for the framework, for the, for the maths, basically. Uh, and to do this, we looked at two more frameworks. So the first of these is called quantum circuits with quantum control of causal order. Uh, this is a bottom-up approach because essentially it, uh, takes this intuition of circuits and tries to channelize it to this setting of indefinite causal order. And the other is called causal boxes. This is a top-down approach. It essentially just assumes some kind of boxes that live in space-time and you can compose them in arbitrary ways. Um, and it turns out that everything in a fixed acyclic space-time is essentially a causal box. So what we did here then is that we connect these two approaches. So for one, we took these QCQCs these quantum circuits and map them to causal boxes. And this allows us to answer this composability question because whenever we have two QCQCs and we want to compose them, instead of doing this in the QCQC framework, this is generally not possible. We map them to these causal boxes and compose them in that framework where this is possible. Um, and then we mapped causal boxes to QCQCs and this allows us to answer this physicality question um, via this second bullet point um, under causal boxes because now we know that uh, since this mapping exists, exists only QCQCs are physical in uh, fixed acyclic space time. And now this is essentially the outline of my talk. Um, I want to give you some intuition of these two frameworks, and then I want to give you some intuition for these mappings that we constructed. Um, so this is a picture of a QCQC, of the QCQC framework, and ignore all the complicated uh, notation here and just focus on the colors essentially. Um, so what you have here is essentially just a circuit. You have some kind of pink thing, and then you can slot in these blue things into the holes. Um, and these blue things are essentially the agents, and uh, the indefinite causal order comes from the fact that we have some quantum control um, down here, which controls uh, which agent acts at which point. So you have here the control, and this tells you that the agent K1 is supposed to act here. 
and this is how you get the indefinite causal order. Um, and it turns out that these cannot violate causal inequalities, and this makes an interesting question, are these all physical processes, uh, all, all physical process matrices? Um, and now these causal boxes are quite different, so before we had these uh, uh, process matrices, and we had the agents, and they're kind of separate, and here we have that every system is just a causal box. So, um, and you can intuitively just think of these as boxes with some kind of input wire over there, and an output wire over there, and then you can send messages on these wires. And um, these messages consist of some classical quantum message, which here is indicated by rho, but then they also have some space time stamp P. So this is again different from the process matrix framework where we kind of drop every assumption of having some background space time. Here we have it explicitly in the framework. And then you can do composition with these. So you can take the output of this causal box psi and feed it as an input into the causal box uh, phi. You can also do parallel composition but you can also do these feedback loops, and you might expect that this represents some kind of trace, maybe, um, or you might expect this to lead to some kind of uh, uh, grandfather paradox, but here is where we get these space-time stamps, uh, where these are relevant. Uh, because what happens here is essentially that we produce an output over here, and then this comes over here, um, and the space-time stamps ensures that this cannot influence itself. So that only some later output can be influenced by this input. So you can think of this as having some, some lab device, and this produces some outputs in one round of experiments, and then you use, reuse these outputs as inputs for the next round of experiments. So you have some sort of causality constraint in this framework. Um, and then what you can also do is you can consider this whole thing as one causal box. So really the point I want to hammer home here is you can do all sorts of composition in this framework, and anything you might want to do in a lab, you can represent in this framework. Um, in terms of composition. Um, now I want to talk a bit more about how these work in detail. So one interesting thing is that in this framework we have a vacuum which just present, represents nothing. And um, an example where you can see this in action is some kind of beam splitter or interferometer where you have some photon coming in from some source and then it's can get reflected and you would write on a state as something like this. So psi on the reflected arm, some state psi here and some state omega on the transmitted arm. So and this omega represents the vacuum, so nothing. And you could also have this be, uh, be transmitted, and then you'd write it like this. So vacuum on the reflected arm over here, and your photon on the transmitted arm. Uh, and more generally, you could have more than one photon in your, in your uh, interferometer, and for this you would use a Fox space. So uh, you would have a Fox space for each arm, and even more generally, you might be interested not just in like arms of an interferometer, um, but regions of your space-time. So we'd have a Fox space for each space-time region. Um, now it turns out that this framework is not ideal for mapping it, for, uh, for, for connecting it to, to QCQC, so process matrices, because they can vi freely violate these causal inequalities. Um, and the reason for this is that the setup assumptions of processes are not respected. Um, so one of these assumptions is that each agent receives only one message and sends only one message. So this can be validated because these causal boxes can send arbitrary many messages. Again, think of this interferometer, um, where you can, in principle, have arbitrary many messages in the arbitrary many photons in the interferometer. Uh, and the second point is that um, in the process matrix framework, an agent only acts when they're prompted. So they don't do anything on their own. They only do something if they get sent some message, and then they will um, send some message on their own. So what you have to do is you have to impose these two constraints on this causal box framework, and then you get a new framework which you call process boxes. And um, so this is very intuitive in a way because it's essentially all causal boxes which are processes. Um, and then it turns out that these also do not violate causal inequalities, so this is a kind of a first hint that maybe these two frameworks are related, QCQCs and process boxes, um, because they both do not violate causal inequalities. Um, okay, now I want to actually talk about these mappings that we, that we made. So um, I want to begin by talking about how we mapped QCQCs to process boxes. Um, and I just want to do this for one specific example. So this is um, so-called dynamical switch. This is a specific QCQC, and in particular what you see here is um, a proposal for how to implement this experimentally. So you see uh, these agents, A1, A2, A3. So you have three agents, which will be in indefinite causal order to each other. And then you have various um, components like uh, coherent copy gates, uh, polarizing beam splitters, and C-not gates. Um, 
I don't want to go into too much detail of what this QCQC does exactly. The main point is that these polarizing beam splitters um, will take photons coming from the agents and then split them. And you see one goes to A2, one goes to A3. So we get this kind of dynamic control of causal order, depending on uh, how A1 prepares her photon. Either A2 will receive the photon or A3 will receive the photon, or we have some kind of superposition between the two. Um, now, for the QCQC, this is only really defined for a single photon. So if you build this in a lab and um, you ask the QCQC framework what happens if I put in one, one, one photon, the QCQC framework is happy and will tell you what should happen. Um, but of course, in the real experiment, you can do interventions. So you can take some, one more photon and you can put it somewhere in the framework. And now the QCQC framework doesn't really know what should happen anymore. Um, so in a way, you can say that the experiment implements the QCQC, but not vice versa in a sense. And what we do then is we essentially think about how should these uh, interventions, what should happen to these interventions, and this is then essentially the behavior of the process box. Um, so the interesting point here is that the process box kind of models how the experiment works, whereas the QCQC is something more abstract. And there will be many experiments that apply to, uh, that correspond to a single QCQC, and every experiment will correspond to a single process box. Um, now, for the other mapping, for the other direction, um, this is mostly quite tedious, to be honest. Um, so I won't give you an example of the mapping. I'll essentially just try to explain to you why you might expect such a mapping to exist. Um, and the point really is here is that QCQCs are controlled processes. So if you forgot the abbreviation, it means quantum circuits with quantum control of causal order. Um, so now, let's say this mapping exists from process boxes to QCQC, then this has the following implications. So one implication is that all process boxes are controlled, because all process boxes would be QCQCs, so controlled processes. And secondly, since we know that all causal boxes are, um, causal boxes are all that exists in physical space-time, in fixed cyclic like space-time, we'd know that all physical processes are controlled. Uh, so you can now ask, like, where is the control in this? Why should I expect everything in fixed cyclic like space-time to be controlled? Um, and for this, we need to ask first, what is control even? Um, so we could also ask, like, how do we identify control? And for this, we can look at single examples. So you can look at the, a C not gate, and you can think, see, okay, I have this identity applied to the target state if the control is in state zero, and this bit flip applied to the target state if the control is in um, in state one. And here we see, okay, we have a control. This is very obvious that this is controlled. We just have an explicit control system. But you could also have something like an implicit control, and let's think again about a beam splitter. So a beam splitter, what, the, what it does is it takes something in um, an incoming photon, and if it's in state zero, it gets transmitted, for example, whereas whatever is reflected is just empty, nothing vacuum. And if it's in one, it gets reflected. Uh, and you can also think of this control, but just implicit control. Uh, the process is controlled by the state of the target system. We don't have some explicit uh, control system, which is kind of separate, but we have the target which tells what to do. Uh, and if you look at both of these, you kind of notice there's some, some orthogonality going on in both. So here you have zero, which is orthogonal to one, so the, con uh, the control system is orthogonal, but also here you have some kind of orthogonality. Um, so the condition we came up with is that uh, if you have two branches and the branches are orthogonal, then we say that there's some kind of control going on between both branches. <clears throat> uh, another way to think of this is that uh, if you did the experiment, if you did this process, you could do some measurement to figure out what happened. So here you could me measure the control bit. And if you got zero, you would know that the density got applied. If you got one, you would know that the uh, bit flip got applied. And the same thing for the beam splitter. If you got zero, you would know that it was transmitted. If it got, got one, you would know that it got uh, reflected. And if you now look at this, um, if you now look at an example of a process box, so a very simple process, we just have Alice and Bob, and Bob then Alice. So these two causal orders, which you can see up there. And now we can ask, is the superposition controlled? So if I take both of these processes and superpose them, is that controlled? And in the process box framework, I now need to add timestamps. So um, <coughs> I'm adding T is one over here, and T is two over there. We could use other timestamps. It really doesn't matter for uh, this, since it's like, you can just rescale, essentially. Mm. And then I put TB and TA for the other one. 
And the question is now, um, does this tell us anything about orthogonality? So first of all, let us notice um, that you have relativistic causality, so we don't want the, um, the future to influence the past. So this immediately tells us that TB has to be less than TA. Um, and this then tells us that we cannot simultaneously fulfill TB is two and TA is one. So at least one of these timestamps of one of these agents needs to be different from the timestamps of the same agent over here. Um, and then if you take essentially the states of these agents, so psi of t and one with phi ta, or alternatively uh, psi of t is two and phi tb, at least one of those needs to be zero. So they cannot both be non-negative because uh, either ta is not one or tb is not two. And this tells us that essentially the space-time labels act as control because they induce this orthogonality. Uh, and this is kind of interesting because it tells us that um, now this whole mapping works. It tells us that um, essentially relativistic causality signals out this class of processes, namely QCQCs, uh, as the one other physical. Okay, now if I've lost you at some point during my talk, um, now it's the time to wake up and essentially just remember this picture here. Um, so I think if you remember this, you, you, you got most of uh, what I wanted to tell you essentially. Uh, so you have two frameworks, you have process matrices and causal boxes. And there's some kind of overlap. And what we did is we showed that this overlap is QCQCs and process boxes. And I've given you some intuition of why this, uh, this is true. And if you're interested in like the details, you can look at, um, uh, um, at, the, at the thesis. <coughs> and in particular, like this, these QCQCs and process boxes, they're causal processes. So they, they do not violate causal inequalities. So this tells us that um, we cannot violate causal inequalities in fixed acyclic space time. Uh, now let me summarize everything. So what we did is we connected a bottom-up approach, which are these QCQCs, and a top-down approach, these are these process boxes to uh, indefinite causal order. And this tells us that the closure of QCQCs on the composition are causal boxes. And it tells us that QCQCs are the only thing that is physical in fixed exactly space-time. Um, in terms of application, this also gives us some hints of what to do. So it tells us that QCQCs are the most relevant thing for near-term applications. If you're thinking about applying uh, indefinite causal order to, um, for some practical purpose, you should probably think about QCQCs because for everything else, you will probably need something like quantum gravity, if it even exists. Whereas QCQCs should be realizable in, um, in it's just a standard lab in Minkowski space-time. Um, and it might also be possible to take some of the results and um, generalize them to quantum and exotic space-times in some way. So maybe we could figure out more about these uh, more exotic scenarios too. Um, and finally, this mapping also gives us a new tool, uh, a new, a new tool uh, because we can now take these QCQCs, these quantum circuits of quantum control of causal order, and analyze them as causal boxes. And uh, this could be interesting because um, as you're seeing, these causal boxes are kind of closer to the actual experiment. Um, the, the QCQC really only tells us about some specific scenario in the experiment, whereas the causal box tells us more about the, the whole setup. So this could potentially uh, yield some new insights um, <coughs> for indefinite causal order. Okay, um, yeah, so thank you for your attention, and you can find the thesis here, and we currently have some papers in preparation, which should hopefully be done soon on the archive. Um, and if you have any questions, please ask them. Any questions? Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I was wondering, so process boxes are not closed on the composition then, right? Because uh, closed, sorry, can you say it again? Process boxes are? Are not closed on the composition. Yes. Right, because the closure is the causal boxes. Yes. And so, uh, so I was just wondering if there's a sub, if there's an interesting subset of causal boxes that is closed under composition and that mimics some sort of uh, that could meaningfully be some sort of process box. Um, because I mean I, I'm just wondering like what lessons this holds for the problem of composing process matrices. Uh, um, yeah, this is a good point. So the lesson here really is that process matrices are not 
I mean, they are close to the composition in, in very specific ways. Um, essentially, the lesson is that either you have to very much restrict the ways you can um, pro, uh, compose process matrices, um, or if you want essentially all the ways that you can do an in, in experiment, ex at least like potentially, you need to go beyond the process matrix framework. <clears throat> and you can also kind of look at this as some kind of hint that maybe process matrices are not fully physical. Um, uh, because they don't really capture the whole physical structure, but just some arbitrary set that's just not completely unreasonable. Um, yeah, and you're also saying it's just some subset of causal boxes that are closed under composition and can be mapped to process matrices. Uh, I would say no, because like if we look at this, so essentially like three regions here, right? right? It's like these, um, the process matrices which do not overlap with causal boxes, the causal boxes that do not overlap with, with uh, process matrices, and the middle. <clears throat> um, so on the left-hand side, we essentially have um, a lot of like causal inequality violating process matrices, but on the right-hand side, we really just have stuff that trivially violates causal inequality, so stuff that uh, sends two messages to one agent. Um, so things that you can't really interpret as, as um, process matrices. Okay. More questions? Uh, hi. Uh, I have a much more uh, trivial question. I think you mentioned it right at the start and I, I missed it. But so, what is the difference between a, a quantum circuit with quantum control, the QCQC, and a, a normal quantum circuit? Like, what is the extra thing you add? Yes. Um, you couldn't really think of these as some sort of quantum circuit. So the main difference is that you have this indefinite causal order um, that you have. Oh, here. So you have the circuit itself, which is the pink part, and then you have the agents, which you can also think of some sort of gate which is locked into the, um, mm -hmm. into the circuit. Um, but then it's not some specific agent or gate that you apply here, but you have this control bit which tells you which one to apply. Okay. Um, so you could imagine that one gate is just an entity, another gate is bit flip, and then you have this, this, this uh, control down here that tells you, do I apply the identity of bit flip? So it's, it's very close to circuits in a way. Could even yeah. think of it as normal circuits. Uh, and I think this is part of the intuition here. So the, it was really the, the goal of the authors of this, um, of this paper here, which, which proposed these QCQCs was really to, to capture this intuition of uh, quantum circuits in this indefinite causal order uh, setting. Because as I was saying, there's not really a clear physical interpretation of process matrices, and this gives you at least a clear interpretation for a subset of process matrices. Okay, thank you. More questions? If not, then uh, let's thank all of the speakers and let's go enjoy the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>